start identifying with doing something for the masses than just for your own glory, like Elvis Presley or certain people who, you know, just see what happens is it's success is a cake. Mm -hmm. You know, being number one in Rolling Stone and Billboard and all of that, it's like a huge cake and you have the choice to eat it all yourself or cut it up in pieces and share it with your brothers and sisters and your friends. That's called progress. I'd rather have progress than success. Success is boring. Everybody who I ever know who's been into success is a boring person. Yeah. Since you, since you started in the early 60s, you've had, say, about 36 band changes. Is that, you know, all, what you want to do? Is that because your members just quit, or why so many? <laughs> Probably all of the above. Uh, mm -hmm. I was blessed and cursed with the path of not having to be like the Grateful Dead or the Who or the Rolling Stones, that, that I have to depend on these people to make me jump when I want to jump. You know, uh, it's a blessing and a curse. It's, it's a blessing because I get to learn so much that I don't have a, PH, a PhD in anything except a feeling. You know, cap a feel, cap a feel, feel a groove. You know, so that way you can get into rap or blues or reggae or anything. You know, where if you just can only play with certain people, I, it works for some people. Uh, the Grateful Dead, they sound fresh and new every time in certain other bands, but for me, it will be quick death. I'm grateful death to me, you know, <laughs> for me. Yeah, you started out playing the, the violin when you were what, five and your father taught you violin. What made you decide to go to guitar instead of another instrument? I never liked the violin. It just sounded very European. I didn't, I didn't like Europe until later. But in the beginning, I didn't like Europe. You know, it's just like, the sound, the smell, and the feel, I said, that's three out of three, you know, I can't, you know. <laughs> you know, it smells funny, you know. Where the, the electric guitar had a different smell, you know, it had a different kind of smell, you know, like. And uh, plus the tone, you know, when I first heard of this person, Javier Batis, and then later on, B.B. King. You know, I, re I read about how people in their 30s, they're just discovering their place in the sun, what they want to be in life. You know, I discovered it when I was like five, and I didn't want to be anything else but, you know, so I don't know what it is to be a weekend musician. I'm a full-time musician ever since I can remember, you know, and, and it's been more fun because th this way, when I went to school, I didn't have to learn about George Washington's wooden teeth and things like that, you know, I just like, just get into Johnny Hooker, Mighty Waters, B.B. King, <laughs> you know, Jimi Hendrix, and like that, you know. That's what I knew it was going to be my, you know, my everything. Yeah, how do you feel about the dubbing of the old music to the new music and the musicians and how they do that and don't have, you know, enough power to do them, write their own music themselves? I like about, out of 100, I think I like about 30%, 40%. I like 100% of the groove on all of the things. I don't like things that they sound gen generic, synthetic, or cute, you know. I like things that they sound feminine and masculine and without calling, you know, your sister a bitch or things like that, you know. I, I don't think that people who have talent, you don't have to, it's like comedians who can really make people laugh till they cry, they don't have to swear, mm -hmm. you know. so. I like things with class, you know. I, I think that there's a lot of rap bands that do have class. You know, I like Paris myself. I I was into MC Hammer like in '88, '89. You know, by the time he hit, I kind of got tired and moved into something else. You know, but I still love the message and the beat. Uh, like MC Hammer is a good, it's a good example of succeeding and still having something positive to say. You know, as far as like. You know, you gotta pray, or you, you know, there's a lot of things that you can. We call it giving people chewing gum for their mind. <laughs> you know, uh, so I, not all of it is bad. I mean, a, a lot of it is is good, especially if they call you before they do your song and say, "Hey, you know, I want to do your song," and I said, "Go ahead." I have been called by some people, and some people they just some people just filthy and dirty, man. And no matter what they do, whether it's rap or the '60s, they they they're just filthy people, you know. So. You have people who have class and people who don't. Artists and con artists. <laughs> <laughs>
That's well, it. it's a never-ending challenge. Every day is a challenge to play with uh, Carlos. Uh, you have to keep moving ahead at all times. You can't get stagnant. And uh, like I said, that everyday challenge is what makes me stay here. I work on what I do every day. You know, I, I practice every day, and I strive to get better every day. You know, uh, I hope that tonight will be my my best performance ever. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you keep looking ahead and reaching for for goals, then uh, you won't get stagnant. You know, if you set your goals too low and you reach them, then a lot of people, you know, become complacent. You know, and think, well, I'm here, I've arrived, I'm successful. Uh, you can't ever, you know, think that you've made it or that, you know, you're the, you're the best that you can be because you can always be better. You know? yeah. And uh, playing with Carlos now, what, 16 years, uh, I, what I like about Carlos is the fact that he, uh, he demands the, the most out of each, of each and every one of his musicians. Um, if you, uh, it's kind of like playing sports. You, if you're on a team, you know, if you're playing baseball, if you go 0 for 4, you know, uh, the, the manager's going to start looking at you. You know, he's going to say, well, what's up with this guy? And if you stay in a slump too long, then uh, they're going to replace you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's basically the way it is in this band uh, with Carlos. He, he, never, he, he never fires any of the musicians. They, they pretty much fire themselves. So you have to work and work and work. Yeah. And I, I love the fact that he brings the best out of me. You know, uh, it's funny, I, I play in a, you know, with other groups and uh, other situations, but it's not the same. Uh, for some reason, when I play with Carlos, I try harder than, than I possibly can. I, although on other situations, I feel I'm trying hard. As soon as I get on the bandstand with Carlos and he looks at me, it's like, I've got to give everything I can. We're, we're kind of like the, the wings that, that Carlos soars on. You know, we're, um, we're a part of him and he's a part of us. Uh, since he plays a melodic instrument, you know, he plays the solos. He and Chester are the soloists, the melodic soloists. But Carlos gives us a lot of room as percussionists to solo as well. And um, there's no other situation I can think of other than, say, a salsa band where uh, you would get some percussion solos, and even then it's not like it is here where you get uh, the audiences that you, that you get and get that nice spotlight from Carlos. He's not, uh, he's not selfish uh, in any way. A lot of people uh, that are you know, band leaders or whatever, they, they want all the spotlight, and everybody else, they're just background musicians. Right. You know, they could be in the dark the whole night, but Carlos isn't that way with us. He realizes that uh, it's a team effort, and uh, he gives us uh, our just uh, do every night. You know, he, he introduces us and he, he treats us with a lot of respect. You know, and I, I think deservedly so, cause, you know, since we work so hard. You know, what made you choose a percussion to play? I, well, it was Carlos. In 1967, I went to a, a rock and roll festival. There was like 15 groups, uh, Steppenwolf, Three Dog Night, uh, big groups from the from the day, from that time, mm -hmm. and uh, I saw the Santana Blues Band. They went in lo went on like second or third to last, second to last, just before Steppenwolf. That's what it was, and it was the first time I seen conga drums played outside of uh, Ricky Ricardo on I the I Love Lucy <laughs> show, and I had never you know seen a conga drum play with popular music, and the sound the the first time I heard someone hit that, that conga, boom, I just, I was hooked. Yeah. And I still am that way today. You know, if, if I'm walking down the street and I hear somebody hit a drum, I'm like, I have to follow that sound and go <laughs> to where they're at. And uh, after seeing them, it inspired me so much that I went out and I bought a conga drum uh, at a pawn shop for like $30. Uh, I'd always wanted to play drums up till then, but drums were a bit more expensive. So I got a conga drum and, and practiced, and I, it was a fleeting thought in my mind that, you know, maybe someday I might be able to play with Carlos. But I was never obsessed with that. What what I was obsessed with was, and still obsessed with, is being the best that I can be at on the conga drum. So that's pretty much how I got started. Um, I joined Malo in 1970 with with Carlos's brother Jorge, mm -hmm. and uh, I was on the the first two albums. I 
played with another group after that called Sapo, which was an offshoot of Malo. The, lead, the guy that sang Suavecito on the Malo album, which was our big hit, started his own group called Sapo. We went, I joined his group from 72 to 76, and then I joined Carlos. And when he called me, it was, uh, it was really, it was something. He, actually, he didn't call me personally. Um, one, of the, one of his managers called me. I'm alone in the house. And I get this telephone call, and it's a man named Arnold Postilnik. And he says, uh, listen, I, I work for the Santana band. I'd like for you to come down and, and play with the band. You know, you've been recommended to come and play. So, you know, I said, yeah, great, I'll be there, you know. And I hang up the phone, and I start running around the house screaming. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know, it was... So, you know, I, it still hasn't set in with me that I, that I get yeah. get to play with this man and, and play in this band. You know, it's it's a dream come true for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a real Cinderella story, I guess. And the way that the Santana band works, we tour usually th three weeks, uh, between three and four weeks max maximum. Uh, after that, we get to go home for two to three weeks. Uh, it's kind of like Carlos uh, says it's like. A jumbo jet going home to refuel you know <laughs> you, you have to spend time with your family and uh, you know if it's music 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 all the time then you'll burn yourself out um, and also you know living on the road I, I'm with the band as much as I'm with my family or, or more so they're, they're my family as well mm -hmm. and you know when you're together all the time you start to hear the same stories you know there's a uh, some points where, you know, after you've been on tour for, you know, throughout the year, you know, still, you know, three weeks on, three weeks off or something like that, uh, there's still points where somebody will come up to you and say, hey, do you remember this story that I, you know, I told you? And I'll say, yeah. And then they'll say, well, forget it. I'm going to tell you again anyway. <laughs> you know, so it just goes on and on. But a lot of groups nowadays, or actually all these years, they'll get out on the road and they'll go for a year. And, you know, those groups will break up after a year or two, because they, you, you just get on each other's nerves eventually. Yeah. Sometimes, it used to be that you used to have to channel your energy uh, in, in the recording sessions to where you were, it was a little bit more mental. You had to think about the arrangement and how you were gonna go from one spot to the other. Uh, this last album, I would say it's the closest thing that, I, that we've recorded to a, an actual live concert. Uh, I had suggested, you know, that we do a live album and other people had suggested it as well, uh, live in the studio. And what they did is they built uh, separate booths for each individual musician. I had my own little wow. room. Oh, wow. And Timbales had their own little room. And we had uh, the ability to separate all the sound and, hmm. you know, not have leakage from one to the other. And the album has that live feel. See, the, the thing was, or the, uh, the people talked about, was that people would come to the concerts and love the concerts and love the energy, yet it didn't translate onto the records. And I think now we finally were able to do it. Uh, I'm, uh, of all the albums that I've done with uh, Carlos and, and the Santana band, Milagro is, is my favorite so far. Uh, I had a lot of freedom. I got to sing a song. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got to do a conga solo that you know, with with no parameters. I got to just play it as long as I wanted to. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm in heaven with this album. Yeah. Carl Peraza, the, the cymbal player with us, is a, a ph phenomenon. I've known him since he was a, a, a youngster, and he and I just play so well together. Uh, there's times when the guitar or the keyboard will do a lick, and you respond, there's always a call and an answer. And oftentimes, Carl and I will do the same, we'll, we'll answer with the exact same lick. And it's, it's not rehearsed. And we'll look at each other like, wow, this is, this is magic, you know? And I'll look at him and I'll, I'll just smile at him and I'll tell him, I love you. It's great to play with you, you know? It's, it's, it's something else. Speaking of that, how does the writing of the music on, on the records, how does that go? I mean, does one guy write a lot of the parts or does everybody just pitch in? Or? Uh, pretty much everybody pitches in. Carlos has a, actually a good idea of the overall picture. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when you look at a, a picture like this here, like I might see only my part. Uh, you know, maybe I've got the left, lower left-hand corner and somebody else has the lower right-hand corner, you know, so on and so forth. Now, Carlos is able to see 
the whole picture and the frame and the wall that it's on and the room that it's in. He has an incredible ear. Uh, yeah. So sometimes he'll, he'll give his ideas to you know, what, what we should play. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he'll just say, yeah, you know what to do. You know, just go ahead and do it. Cool. Yeah, a lot of people comment on my smile because uh, they come to the show and they see me smiling almost the whole show. <laughs> and wh what that comes from is like what I was telling you. Uh, I'm doing something that I, I wanted to do. You know, I've always wanted to do. And uh, I'm so happy up there. There's nowhere on the face of this earth or in this universe that I would rather be than on that stage at that time. And I think it's important to give this smile to other people. If I can make somebody happy, then I've, I've done a good day's work. You know, there's a, there's a poem called A Smile, and one of the passages is, uh, a smile is a wonderful gift because it costs the giver nothing, yet the one that receives it gets so much out of it. You know? And a little smile goes a long way, you know? Uh, it's pretty spontaneous. There are areas, depending on the song, which dictate what you do. There's areas for solos, there's uh, areas for a melodic phrase, there's sometimes the end of a, end of a song where we are doing exchange like on Spirits Dancing in the Flesh. Yeah. And uh, a lot of things happen spontaneous. You're like, I mean, a keyboard god. And I compare like a lot of other keyboards to you. But I mean like, when you were my age, who were, who were your mentors? Who, who did you look up to? How old are you? 16. 16. Um, well, now, you have 16. Um, Bill Doggett, for his organists, are concerned. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's going back there. I guess Jimmy Smith was the one that really brought it to the forefront. Uh, I was interested in jazz at 13, and Alma Jamal. That was my first introduction to jazz. But during those days, or during those times, uh, we took it for granted in school, but there was a lot of that in school, you know, music appreciation, which a lot of this type of culture filtered through there, which kids were exposed to. Don't have that now. And uh, I owe a lot to that, now looking back on it. Well, the, the one difference is playing the organ, you can be three people. And I always got a thrill out of being three people. Playing your bass and, and uh, playing your chord and your melody at the same time. And then when Jimmy Smith came along with that style, or Wild Bill Davis, or whichever one wanted to be first, Jimmy Smith made it most famous. Um, with that, with that style, that's still coming from the same place. Yeah. In general, speaking of sessions, uh, you're normally it's there's a certain amount of dictatorship. You know, someone has a project, they have a vision of whatever it is they're doing, and some way in that vision they envision you doing something. Sometimes they have an idea of what they want you to do. Sometimes they don't have a clue what they want to do. Uh, live is spontaneous. At the same time, it's still organized. Everybody, you, it's, it's more humanistic. You're not dealing with tape machines. You can't say, whoops, I didn't mean to make that mistake. Can you roll it back? Can I have tape two, three, four, or five, or whatever? <laughs> you know, and uh, that I like. And you're playing before people. The feedback, it's a more human environment uh, because you're bouncing off of the people, the public that you're playing for and their response to it. And uh, there's something about that that is hard to explain. It's when you hear athletes talk about, you know, like the dream team or yeah. just special events, just that connection with people and that response. That's what it is. It's a humanistic, more of a humanistic environment and uh, it's natural. How did you g get to work with Santan? How did you have that start in 83? Uh, in 83, uh, at the time, Carlos had the idea of having two keyboardists in the band. And at the time, it was a lean, a lean period with Tower Power. And uh, I thought in my mind maybe it was a time to make a change. Plus, uh, over the years, even during the Tower days, we had opened for Santana several times. Uh, even before I joined Tower Power. So there was always a relationship. 
Uh, I even played on one of the albums, Dick, uh, Garibaldi and myself. Uh, so there was already a relationship. I knew Tom Costa very well. Yeah, he and Jules Broussard. I played with Jules. I took Tom's place when he left. So there was already a relationship there. And uh, when the call came about, um, I, that, that's pretty much how it happened. You know, I got a call, and before I knew it, I was in the band. Hmm. Uh, I actually finished uh, up with Tower of Power on my birthday of uh, 83. <laughs> and the next day I was with Santana in Germany. Well, you got to believe in what you're doing, number one. And you have a dream of what you want to do and a hunger for that. As long as you have a hunger for that, uh, regardless to whether you have success or not, the hunger is what's important uh, or important. Being in the right place at the right time is important. All of those factors are important. But, uh, you know, sometimes the right connections are not necessarily the right connections. There's all kind of variables. There's always a plus and a minus. You know, one side you might get this great op opportunity. Being young, sometimes you can be taken advantage of and you lose out on the other end. They take advantage of you and you think you, you're making money, you're not making money, and, and it gets into that aspect of it. So uh, I would think the main thing is stay hungry and keep your dream alive. Oh, yeah, in fact, because of Jack McDuff, I'm on the road. Uh, I met Jack McDuff in Oklahoma City. That's where I'm originally from. Uh, I played opposite him at a nightclub, and he encouraged me. Same thing that I'm saying. He said to me, uh, uh, if you have the dream and if you have the skill and the talent, he just advised me. He said, you should just go on the road. That's the only way you find out. You have to make the sacrifice. Let the chips fall where they may. Do you feel that you learn like a lot more than what you learned when you first started doing out? The more you go. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. From different aspects. You know, the learning process is pretty broad. You know, from a musical standpoint, simplicity. That's a hard one to get back to. From a young age, you're always striving to be as technical, or as complicated as those you admire. Sometimes you go past it. There's a lot of things as far as maturity is concerned. It's yeah. just natural. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just a gift. Uh, you know, five, you don't know. <laughs> I, I saw somebody playing something and I remember trying to play Boogie Woogie and being able to pick it out. I remember that. And I remember the church pianist, which was a classical piano. So, was in the symphonies in Oklahoma and all that. I suggested to my mom that I should take lessons. And that's where I started. Well, spiritual, when you speak of spirituality, that's an interpretation up to the individual of what you interpret. But uh, for me, I, I, I consider it being honest. Like anything else, it's honest coming from your heart. Whether it be politics or whatever, people feel it. Mm -hmm.